so next up, we have Dr. Asia Ahani. She is MassMutual's lead data scientist. She has a bachelor's degree in electrical and electronics engineering from Ferdowsi University of Mashhad, a master's degree in bioengineering and biomedical engineering from KN Tuzi University of Technology, and a PhD in bioengineering and biomedical engineering from Northeastern. Upon joining MassMutual in 2017, she brought extensive experience leveraging data science in the marketing domain, working with Visual IQ and Northeastern University. She currently leads the MassMutual team on data-driven research, problem solving, and algorithm development through the systematic application of mathematics, statistics, and computer science, as well as cutting-edge data technologies. Her work revolves around studying fundamental and high-impact MassMutual marketing sales questions that directly impact the direction of the company as well as the industry at large. Welcome. Hello, my name is Asia Ahani, and I'm a lead data scientist at MassMutual. I'm going to cover how we're leveraging technical methodology to transform a business unit. Uh, first, I'm going to give a little bit of institutional knowledge about MassMutual and a department called Workplace Solution within MassMutual, and then I'm going to cover how we collaborate with them inside data scientist department in order to transform their business into a more data-driven and intelligent business unit. So MassMutual as a brand is known as a mutual life insurance company based in Massachusetts, but MassMutual uh, provides uh, many financial uh, products such as disability insurance, long-term care annuity, and some major uh, uh, affiliate with Barings and Haven Life Insurance. Workplace Solution is a department within MassMutual who is responsible to uh, maintain and uh, provide service for retirement plan and volunteer benefit that are offered to employee, employees by their employer. Basically, it's a convergence of all the benefit, health insurance, um, um, disability, uh, volunteer benefit, and retirement plans through workplace. And a workplace solution not only provides uh, services for that, also um, manage the assets under management for, uh, for those companies, and also provide innovative tools that people can use as education or see their portfolio and the benefits that they're receiving by their employer. So uh, the first uh, step of developing a data science product, the first three steps are generating ideas, uh, rationalizing, and planning for that product. So when we're talking about a collaboration between data science and workplace solution, we have to first identify where we can enter and make an impact and transform the business. So uh, if you consider the marketing uh, path that each par uh, participant take, it looks like a funnel. On the top of the funnel, we have all the prospects. Generally, in marketing campaign, the prospects are people that we want them to become customers, but for workplace solutions, prospects can be existing customers. They're just prospects to perform an additional action on their plan. So the first step is to identify the actions that they can make. This requires a lot of data analytics uh, to identify what type of actions are possible and how much value will be generated. Then we have to identify people who are eligible for that action and then rank them based on the propensity and the opportunity that that action will um, result. And then that really helps us to narrow down uh, the pool of prospect into a targeted group that we can uh, use to build intelligent campaign en engagement. Not only designing campaign, but also prioritizing opportunities or plan on-site visit and successfully help them to turn that opportunity into action. And then use that in order to update the way that we identify prospects. So uh, planning is the part that I personally am very involved in because I'm leading all efforts for workplace solutions. So uh, coming from academic background, we usually want to dive in development and uh, start building models and writing equations, but it's really helpful to take a step back and say, 
okay, I'm talking about millions of millions of recommendations. What is my data strategy? How can I build pipeline that I can build these models on top of and how I'm gonna deliver them to stakeholders in a way that helps them to make the best decision given that recommendation? More, more importantly, how I'm going to monitor the performance, performance of the model because it's actually directly impacting the business. So it's very important to make sure that the model is performing very well. Uh, also, how can, I identi uh, how can I identify the opportunities available for all prospect? This is only example list of the opportunities that are available. Uh, the propensity to enroll, uh, people can increase their salary deferral amount, people can consolidate assets from outside sources into their retirement plan, they can enroll in volunteer benefits, they can request account management or at the at, on the plan level, a plan can enable HSA or GIA or aut automatic enrollment. So once that planning is done, uh, which takes really a, a very, very long time, and that plan is laid out, then we can go into what I call the magic word of mathematics, where everything makes sense. Um, and then we can actually uh, start and build our models. Because we, had a f be, uh, we have a big list of opportunities, I'm just going to use one specific ex example. The uh, consolidation, meaning that a prospect will uh, bring some outside asset into their 401k plan or uh, turn their 401k and roll it over to an IRA. So we have four million prospects who are eligible for that. How can we rank them based on the propensity that they would do that? So first, we have to get the raw data. We have to identify everybody in the past who was eligible to do that and those who actually did it. And then we have to go through a lot of data cleaning, missing uh, imputation of missing data, feature engineering. Feature engineering totally depends on what type of model we're trying to solve. For example, a person who would uh, roll in asset into their plan, they're probably very engaged in their plan. So one feature can be the t how many times they made changes in their plan. What is the time interval since last change to now? So these are the type of features that we can engineer based on the metric that we're trying to optimize, and it totally depends on the model. And then um, we generally take 20% of the data out, as you know, just to make sure that what's going to happen in the real world scenario. And then within the 80% of the data, we do a lot of cross validation. We keep changing the validation set within our training set to make sure that the hyperparameter are optimized on the whole um, uh, data um, training set. Um, and then basically we use that in order to find the propensity. The big, the, the bigger, uh, the biggest thing that we did in this uh, stage is that we made this pipeline fully automated. So right now, a data scientist can go to a parameter file, choose, I want to test these five imputation techniques and these three models and these four hyperparameters. And the pipeline runs everything together and gives them report. They can look at the performance and compare the model results and choose the best model. So before it took months in order to build a model, now it re it's really efficient and it's really helping us to identify what type of model works on what type of data. Uh, we also, it really helps us to provide the met model performance, not only f to ourselves in order to compare model, but also to our uh, uh, stakeholders. Uh, in a, the metrics that we usually report are the model AUC and also the lift. For example, we realize that 73% of the corresponders can be, uh, can be captured by outreaching to only the top three D cells. So it's really useful information to the stakeholders in order to build campaigns. Also, we can give them some, uh, basically some information as an educate with like educational intention. Like what are the top drivers for a positive response across demographics, gender, marital status, and age, or the features that we engineered? For example, people who have 413 are more probable to consolidate assets or have more income based on census information. Um, the second part that we want to calculate is the opportunity, which is completely different from propensity. Let's say a young person is very probable to roll in asset, but young people don't have a lot of money. <laughs> so the opportunity is a completely different prediction that we can do. Um, 
by opportunity here, I mean the cash flow, the cash that will be resulted uh, uh, as based on a positive action. That will not necessarily be the value added to the business because in order to calculate the value added to the business, we do a lot of quantitative finance based on equity rate, uh, pricing of the plan, tax rate, predicted tax rate, a, a macroeconomical factors. So uh, I'm just gonna skip that part completely and just talking about how can we predict the cash flow as a result of an action. Um, you know, for that, we take the positive class, or, or all the people who actually did roll in asset, and then we do a, a, a lot of feature uh, discretization, feature selection, and we also try out different methodologies such as bucketing strategy, bootstrap, basic linear regression, and then we go back and forth between feature engineering and feature selection part and uh, the model selection by trying out the combination of this methodology on different sets of the data on the validation set in order to find the best feature engineering and met model methodology that gives us the best uh, estimation. Before going to the f uh, full continuous service, again, we're impacting business directly, so it's very important to be careful. We usually have a pilot or a test um, phase that we just tr tr we're trying to look at the performance of the model. So we usually have a treatment group, and in the treatment group, the marketers approach them or co uh, contact them based on the model-driven results, for example, the top 3D size. And the control group, we don't campaign to them. It really helps us to stay honest and realize that, okay, yes, the response rate is much higher, uh, and it's consistent with what we simulated in the test set. Uh, also, it really helps us to quantify the business impact of the model. For example, in the pilot phase of the roll-in, we realized that the top three D side account for 15.4 million of the expected contribution, which is around 65% of the total. So we can actually quantify the importance of the model. But another good metric that we can calculate here is to actually identify the group of people that we want to campaign to. Because generally, a re traditional response model cannot identify whether a person responded because they saw the campaign email or they just did it anyway because they have a high propensity to do that. And a, a traditional response model cannot measure that. But by having a control group, we can uh, start building uplift models, which is designed in order to find the important, the effect of the marketing campaign on the treatment group by not optimizing the probability of conversion by optimizing the incremental lift between treatment and group. And mathematically speaking, it's the probability of convert given treatment minus the probability of convert given control, uh, but this is only the equation. The way you solve it, there are different methodologies to solve that. So basically, the group that we want to reach out to them are the persuadable. Especially, we don't want to reach out to do not disturb meaning that people who would respond if you don't campaign to them, which I didn't know they exist, but apparently <laughs> that's a thing. So um, just one more thing that I want to mention on this slide is that this is so important that we actually keep the control during full production because we want to keep measuring this uplift model effect on the campaign. Um, this is how the full continuous service pipeline work, uh, looks like. That's why it's very important to plan ahead because we have to make sure that this pipeline uh, is designed before we actually start implementing. And uh, we have the campaign pipeline and we have the prospect pipeline and in different portions on the campaign pipeline, we have the metric monitoring and modern monitoring uh, parts that we can keep monitoring how the model is performing, how, what is the distribution of features. Let's say in the July campaign, we realized that the distribution of male population to everyone is 10 times bigger than average or all other campaigns. We know that something happened there. So that's why it's very important to monitor the, metri and the, the features and also the metrics, the AUC of the model, uh, uh, the response rate, the value added to the business. And also we uh, have another uh, pipeline that is the prospect that works as, uh, basically we use that in order to build visualization tool for relationship managers. So relationship manager can actually go to this visualization tool and see 
all these opportunities and uh, propensity shown to them in a way that they can understand and they can make decisions based on that. And that's why that planning for the delivery is very important. So in, in the sponsor plan level, you can look at all the participation rate, uh, the percentage of uh, propensity across all participants in that plan, uh, the mindset segmentation uh, percentage, which is another initiative we took into in within sales and marketing department um, that we uh, apply a personic financial personic segmentation on all customer, regardless of what products they have. Also in participant level, you can bring up uh, and a specific participant pro profile and see all the opportunities and propensity within one inter interface. So it really helps the relationship manager to recommend the best policy to the participant. Again, somebody might have a low propensity by high opportunity. Maybe it makes sense that I recommend that product to them. Um, and then generally, the most uh, we can uh, across the whole book of business, we can look at the rolled up view. We can look at look at where are the opportunities across relationship manager assignment can be used for rotation optimization, market segment, asset segment, revenue to benchmark and geography. So plan uh, uh, architect, plan a sponsor architect can use this rolled up view to make decisions for the plan as a whole, not for each individual separately. Um, this is the sales and marketing uh, domain uh, within data science department, Mass Mutual. Um, and thanks for listening. Hi, th thank you for for your presentation. Uh, do you mind giving more detail about how to do uh, future engineering or future selection? Because uh, there's a lot of raw data, but not all of them are help. So that's a key point to find the most important information to fit a model to get a better result. Thank you. Yeah, so that, that's why I said like it took months before to build these models because we had to find out what are the best practices to do mod feature selection, feature engineering, and feature cleaning, especially like imputing missing values totally can change the final result based on the methodology you use. So we, we built s several models initially, and we came up with the best practices, the list of approaches that we can make, and we added all those possibilities into our modeling pipeline. So our modeling pipeline runs the camp runs the model for each scenario. So we have an idea, and we have like uh, sometimes like 20 to 50 different scenarios based on different methodology of feature engineering, feature selection, and imputation, and model itself. The model has many hyperparameters itself, so the combinations are really large. And then based on that, we see all the results in a single report, and it really helps us to find what is the best approach we can make. <laughs>